let's learn about race conditions. First and foremost, what are they? Well, according to Wikipedia, a race condition is where the system's substantive behavior is dependent on the sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. Well, cool, what is a security vulnerability race condition? That is when the substantive behavior depends on attacker controllable events. So there's two types of people in the world. There are the lumpers and the splitters. I am the latter type. I like me a good taxonomy. I like to split things up finely and say, you know, what is this and how is it different from something else? So let me give you a Venn diagram of race conditions. And a subclass of race condition that we're going to see in this class is the double fetch vulnerability. So all double fetches are race conditions, but not all race conditions are double fetches. A subset of the double fetch vulnerability is the talk to vulnerability, time of check, time of use. That is a situation where you fetch once and you check something and then you fetch again and you use it, but between the time that you checked it and you used it, a race condition could have occurred and the attacker could have swapped out something that was clean at check time with something that is acid at use time. And while I like me a good taxonomy, this isn't a taxonomy. This is the eye of Hal, who's coming to kill us all. But when I was looking at the eye of Hal for a while, eventually I convinced myself that actually there are time of check, time of use vulnerabilities that are race conditions that do not involve a double fetch. So the vast majority are double fetch, but I convinced myself that, you know, there are some corner case type situations typically doing to do with uh, shared memory and stuff like that, where there isn't actually a double fetch. Uh, it's just things can change out naturally behind the scenes. So we're not going to see any of those cases in this class, at least with the current examples at the time of the initial recording, but I believe they do exist. Okay, so the root causes for these race conditions is largely down to shared resources and parallelism. By shared resources, I mean things like RAM, volatile memory, and non-volatile memory, things like spy flash, EEPROM, hard drive for file systems, stuff like that. So between the two of those, that's all the types of memory, volatile and non-volatile. So when you have a shared resource and there is parallelism in play, you have the opportunity for race conditions. So this can either be the sort of faux parallelism or fake parallelism, which is multi-threading. So you can imagine you have two clients talking to the same server, two tabs executing JavaScript in the same browser, two user space threads or applications executing system calls in the same OS on a single CPU, two operating systems running in the same hypervisor. So this sort of thing where you have context switching, but it's actually just flopping back and forth and there's not true parallelism going on. That's like multi-threading sort of situation. And then of course you can have the true parallelism when you have multi-processing and that is where you've got multiple CPUs. So two CPU cores inside of the same system on a chip, or for instance, two separate chips that are accessing a shared bus like PCIe. So I'm going to show some examples in this intro section where we've got the shared resource in the middle. And so, for instance, you could have user space having access to the file system and the kernel having access to the file system. And if there is parallelism between them, like user space is running on one CPU, the kernel is running on a different CPU, then there's opportunities for race conditions to occur. But it doesn't just have to be things like the kernel and user space sharing file system. They could also be sharing something like RAM. There could be explicit shared memory regions that are set up between kernel and user space. This is a common paradigm for, for instance, getting data into kernel space. There might be a shared buffer and user space writes some data to the shared buffer and kernel space reads it. And there's lots of vulnerabilities with that sort of paradigm across all the different operating systems when mutual exclusion is not properly enforced to avoid race conditions. But it doesn't just have to be kernel and user space sharing DRAM. It could be kernel and firmware sharing DRAM. Let's imagine that you've got your network card and it's running firmware out to the side. Well, literally the exact design of things like network interface cards is that there is a shared buffer and a kernel or a kernel driver for that particular network interface card is responsible for writing some packet data out to go out to the firmware and send a packet and the firmware reads packet data in and that shared DRAM is shared with kernel driver that then reads the packets in and sends them to user space or kernel space wherever they need to go.
But it doesn't just have to be kernel and firmware sharing DRAM. They could also share something like non-volatile RAM. So this would be things like the spy flash chip. We see back in the 1001 class, there were a few vulnerabilities having to do with BIOS. And one of them, for instance, was accessing the UEFI NVRAM variables or non-volatile variables. So access to the same spy flash chip between firmware and kernel can be another opportunity for race conditions. But it doesn't just have to be kernel and firmware, it can be other firmware and firmware. So you can have two pieces of firmware that are sharing the same non-volatile memory, and there can be race conditions between those. So let's talk about those categorizations of race conditions that I gave earlier. The first one is talk to, time of check, time of use. But at this point, I have to warn you that if you stare long into the slides, the slides also stare into you. Because I was spending way too much time making these slides last year, and eventually these things looked like eyes to me, and then I made a silly little animation. So the way that we typically visualize race conditions is that we might have one user space process and time is going from top to bottom and a second malicious user space process with time going top to bottom. There's some shared resource in the middle. We don't know what it is. Could be RAM, could be file system. The first legitimate process reads to try to verify some data and it's green and it's clean to start with. But then the attacker writes malicious data in there and then it reads and it writes and it reads and it writes. And the thing is, at the time of those reads, everything was clean. And at the time of usage, everything was dirty. So this is a time of check, time of use vulnerability. At the time of check, everything read out as non-acid, but if it does you know, a verify function followed by an execute in place function, then by the time that it starts to execute in place, it has been filled in with acid. And the quick point I would make here is that we said that talk to attacks are generally subclasses of double fetch vulnerabilities. This is the first explicit fetch, but then sort of implicitly here, if I'm saying that it's executing this stuff, if it's executing it in place, that's sort of an implicit fetch. And that implicit fetch is often what gets people in trouble. So that's time of check, time of use vulnerabilities. Usually a double fetch, certainly all the examples we currently have in this class are double fetch vulnerabilities. Then we have double fetch vulnerabilities, which need not necessarily be talk to vulnerabilities. And if you're saying to yourself, why is that dog wearing a tutu? I was also saying that to myself because again, I made these slides last year and then they were originally for vulnerabilities 1001. And then we decided to make twice as many examples for half as many vulnerability types. And I came back and I could not figure out why this dog was wearing a tutu until I said it a couple of times aloud to myself because that's tutu, the double fetching dog. Yes, that's the dog's name, Tutu. So, sequence diagram. User space process non-malicious, user space process malicious. The first fetch by the non-malicious process gets a nice green ball that is non-acid data. Then the attacker writes a red acid ball into the shared location. And then the code fetches again for some reason. And on this fetch, they get the acid ball. So, bad Tutu, bad dog, don't double fetch. Oh, but... You're not a bad dog. You're a good dog. It's the programmer who programmed you to double fetch who's bad. So that's double fetch vulnerability, which need not necessarily be a time of check, time of use. So let's look at an example quick. This was some real but simplified code from the Windows kernel from a while back. And so in this case, the attacker in user space was allowed to provide a pointer to a buffer in user space. And that pointer would be stored in kernel space in this buffer size. And then they could also provide a pointer to the buffer itself. So they'd say, hey, kernel, here's my buffer and here's how long it is. But these are acid pointers. And when you dereference that pointer, you are fetching from DRAM where that pointer points. So this right here is acid being used for an allocation. So that in and of itself is a bad thing. And then if a race condition occurs, so if the kernel stops and halts and context switches somewhere else and runs some other code, well, if another CPU could have some code run that changes out the content that's stored at that buffer size pointer, then all of a sudden a completely different value will be used down here. So an allocation with one size occurred here and a memory copy with a different size occurred later on. Consequently, if that different size was bigger, this would be an under allocation and this would be an over copy. And we're right back to the simple buffer overflows that we learned about in vulnerabilities 1001.
Put another way, this first pointer dereference is fetch1, but then if the context switches out and a race condition occurs, this second pointer dereference is fetch2, and that is going to be a double fetch vulnerability. But now I said in this particular case that this is not a talk to vulnerability because there was essentially no check. So there's no sanity check of any sort right here. It's just usage one, usage two. So that's double fetching, but it's not time of check, time of use. And now when I saw this vulnerability, I kind of went, mm, because I know that I could write this kind of vulnerability very easily. And so could you, I think. This sort of vulnerability where it's as subtle as just dereferencing a pointer like you would do very naturally all the time, well, if you're not aware of the fact that there's parallelism opportunities going on, if you're running in the kernel, for instance, then you may not realize that just dereferencing a pointer that happens to point to user space where an attacker could change out the value thanks to parallelism, that dereferencing a pointer in and of itself is a dangerous operation. So again, the root causes of these race conditions is the combination of shared resources. So this is the shared memory between user space and kernel space and the opportunity for parallelism. So again, that was not a talk to, that was a double fetch that had no check. So here's another very similar example from the same researchers, just the white paper version instead of the slides. And so here we have a first fetch of some pointer that's pointing at user controlled address and they helpfully provided it in red as ACID. So this is a dereferencing of the pointer, but this is for a sanity check. This is for something that's trying to avoid a buffer overflow down below. So fetch one, time of check, explicitly being used as a security check, and everything looks good at that point. It's not too big, but context switch and do the old switcheroo, change out the content, and now this second dereference of the value is ACID. And so the time of use this is going to buffer overflow. So you've got ACID, you've got a fixed size local buffer on the stack, and consequently that is an under allocation because the attacker can change out the size and this will be an overcopy. So just like we saw back in the integer overflow and underflow section, we saw integer overflows and underflows could be used to bypass sanity checks and reopen your traditional stack and heap overflow. So in this case, you can see that the race condition, when it's a time of check, time of use, it's reopening a traditional buffer overflow. All right, so that's an example of talk to. Finally, let's cover just other race conditions that don't fit into those two categories. So once again, back to the definition, what is a race condition generically? It's where the system's substantive behavior is dependent on a sequence or timing of other uncontrollable events. And we said that if they become attacker controllable events, then that is where we have security vulnerabilities. So let's again imagine we have a shared resource and we have process one writing into the shared resource, but then just in time, process two writes into it as well and they write some acid. Right before the process one is going to read that shared resource. And so now they're reading back ACID instead of reading back clean data that they had written in here. And this is very much a traditional race condition in the sense that it all depends on like when this write comes in versus when that write comes in. So if the ordering was changed or if the ordering is variable between these and sometimes the attacker's write comes in first, well, the attacker doesn't win the race in that condition. They only win the race if they can control the ordering or timing of the events to ensure that their write occurs after the good write and before the good read. And so this is the sort of generic race condition. Anytime that there's variability, the attacker wants to manipulate the events in such a way that they can guarantee that they will always win the race. So how do you normally deal with race conditions? Well, you deal with it with mutual exclusion. You have something like a lock on the shared resource. You lock it, and then this attempt to write by the attacker is denied. And later on, when the first process is done with the resource, it unlocks it, and at that point, the attacker can write, but it doesn't matter because at that point, the good process has already successfully read the clean data. So the generic race condition solution is mutual exclusion. Mutual exclusion is no race condition. Improper mutual exclusion is when there are opportunities for race conditions. So that was an example of a race condition that is neither double fetch nor talk to attack, right? Because they only fetched once. It's just they wanted to make sure that the attacker couldn't manipulate that single fetch.
Now I want to be clear that mutual exclusion does not always mean that you have to use mechanisms such as mutexes, semaphores, or locking primitives. In the case of double fetch, it suffices to basically just fetch once, store it somewhere that the attacker can't manipulate it, like a local variable on your stack if you know, you're the kernel and their user space or you're some firmware and they're the kernel. You just need to store something in a non-manipulatable location. So fetch it once and then use the copy, use the clean copy that the attacker can't manipulate anymore. You will have successfully achieved mutual exclusion without the need for things like mutexes. So the big takeaway from this section is that sharing is not caring. And specifically, sharing without mutual exclusion is not caring. Because we said the core and root causes of these race condition vulnerabilities are parallelism and shared resources. Well, you're probably not going to get rid of the parallelism and go back to single CPU, single threading, or anything else like that. So parallelism is a necessary component of modern computing. So what we have to focus on is making sure that those shared resources are accessed with mutual exclusion. It's just recognition of those situations in which a resource could be shared and in which parallelism could cause that resource to change over time.